Well, it's, a, it's actually a great pleasure of mine to introduce a good friend, uh, Dr. David Presti, who is a senior lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where he, I think he has taught thousands and thousands of students neuroscience over the last uh, decade plus. Um, for many years, uh, Dr. Presti also worked in clinical, as a clinical psychologist in the treatment of addiction and of post-traumatic stress disorders at the Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center in San Francisco. Um, where he treated thousands of individuals for these conditions. David has, a doc has doctorates in molecular biology and biophysics from the California Institute of Technology and in clinical psychology from the University of Oregon. His primary research interests are in the relation between mental phenomena, such as, what, such as what is called consciousness, as we are trying to define today, and brain physiology, and the so-called mind-brain -brain problem. David has also taught at uh, five previous science workshops going back to 2004, uh, including our most recent workshop we had, uh, we just concluded with the monastic graduates. So uh, please let's welcome Dr. David Presti. Thank you, Bryce. And uh, thank you everyone for the honor of being here. Uh, I just have to say that this is a tremendous, a really special honor because I think this is a really special moment in the evolution of this dialogue that His Holiness had the wisdom to suggest back in the 1980s to come together uh, between contemplatives and science, scientists and discuss questions that were at really the most basic levels of, uh, of uh, uh, of appreciating who we are, what our mind is, and how we relate to the rest of the universe. And, and for 25 years, there has been a very active dialogue, which has been institutionalized in the Mind and Life conferences uh, that uh, have involved His Holiness and, a, and a various scientists over the years, but relatively few other monastics and this this is an amazing thing that we're now through these educational programs of science for monks and and the Emory Library collaboration uh, being able to uh, really expand this dialogue to so many um, so many people in the Buddhist tradition which is a, a tremendous thing so many monks and venerable monks and nuns being here so this is a very very special moment uh, the, um, I, I don't know how much new I'm going to be saying in the next 30 minutes or so uh, because many really powerful ideas have been put forth already in the day and a half that we've been talking. More will come. Uh, and what I will say, though, will be my way of saying it. So sometimes uh, different, ways of, different ways of hearing the same thing are very valuable in, in appreciating the complexity of these problems. So um, this is the Andromeda galaxy, again, this famous galaxy, which is our nearest neighbor in the, in the heavens. Uh, about uh, sometime back in the 1970s, there was a uh, short 10 minute or so documentary movie made that was called Powers of Ten. And Powers of Ten uh, tried to illustrate in a movie form actually did a very good job of illustrating in a movie form the scale that Paul was just talking about from the very largest things in the, the size of the universe, for example, all the way down to subatomic particles, 10 to 42 orders of magnitude or so. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to show that movie, but uh, uh, a few years ago, there's a, there's a very famous American television cartoon uh, called The Simpsons. Uh, some of you may know. Uh, and it's in, in America, I believe it's the longest running show that's ever been on television. It's very clever. Uh, and a few years ago they had a, it's still on, a few years ago they had a uh, opening scene that was a, a variation on this Powers of Ten. And I think it illustrates a very interesting uh, thing about the theme of our conference, uh, Cosmology and Consciousness, so I'm just going to take 30 seconds to share that with you now.
So, in, as uh, some say in America, this is considered a comedy. However, this is saying some really profound things, I think. Uh, the, you asked a few minutes ago about the connection between cosmology and consciousness and, and what can we say about it. We can certainly say what you said, you know, that everything that we know about anything at all, we believe is coming through our consciousness. It's coming through our awareness and any theories we have about the physics of the universe have been created by our brains, minds. Uh, and uh, so there's that connection between cosmology and consciousness. In fact, it was something like that connection that first got me interested in, in this whole subject because when I was an undergraduate student, I was studying physics and general relativity. And I began to wonder like how it was that Einstein could sit in his room and invent a theory that describes the whole universe. I mean, how is it possible for humans to do that? So that's definitely a connection between cosmology and consciousness. I think another connection which we don't know about yet and which is somewhat embodied or illustrated in this uh, movie is that there's some profound connections between our inner reality of our mind and the outer reality of our, what we call physical reality, including the large-scale nature of the universe that are still very much beyond our limits of knowing how these things are connected. And that I believe that perhaps the next big revolution in science uh, will, in fact, somehow shed some light on that. I think that would be very exciting if that were the case. Um, and there's no reason that it may not be the case. And, so, and, the, and what we're doing here really speaks to that possibility. So <clears throat> West, the word science actually comes from knowing, to know. Uh, and so science is a way of asking questions about our world of experience uh, and designing ways to test, gather data, do experiments, and then form theories to try to explain organizations of things. It's a way of gathering information and organizing it and expanding our framework of understanding uh, by doing that. Uh, so it's a very, very general term. It, could, it, it applies to understanding our outer world, and there's every reason that it could also apply to understanding our inner world, asking questions, gathering data, developing theories, and so forth. Western science, what we call Western science, uh, which is developed out of the tradition of Europe and, and America, really has now spread to the entire world. It's, it's the way, uh, kind of the framework uh, in which science has, uh, is, is conceptualized over the entire world, um, is grounded in astronomy. Uh, it began with trying to understand the movement of the planets and the movement of the moon and the sun and the earth. And, and these guys here are the sort of acknowledged founders of Western science, Copernicus, Galileo, Descartes, Newton. Uh, Newton made, uh, Descartes was actually one of the first people to sort of suggest that uh, it works well to try to understand our outer world, that our inner world is maybe more complicated. Uh, and Newton took this to the next step. Uh, he explicitly said, I can't deal with experience. You know, I, I don't know how to account for the redness of red. What I can talk about is the mathematical properties of light. Uh, and he invented an entire mathematics and, was, you know, and, and physics around it to do that. Uh, and Newton also uh, was very good at, at making connections between the movements of the planets and the sun and moon and what was happening here on Earth, like an apple falling and showing that there were universal uh, regularities and laws that could describe these things. And so this has become an extremely successful uh, uh, framework uh, and has been expanded by people like Maxwell there down at the bottom and Einstein uh, into the 20th century and provided by the beginning of the 20th century, you know, a, an awesomely 
successful framework for describing our physical world. And in the 19th century, this began uh, to be applied to biological things too. Darwin uh, was uh, really the, the main mover of a revolutionary new way of looking at living organisms. Uh, and as our technologies of observation got better and better uh, in the 20th century so that we could examine cells and later molecules and, and so forth, uh, we were able to describe the cellular and molecular chemical makeup of living organisms in a really detailed way that was completely continuous with the way physics uh, and astronomy describe the larger scale structure of the universe. And so we now have, if we bring this to the present day, we now have an awesomely and beautiful and stunningly powerful uh, framework of understanding, which we call physical science or biophysical science, if we wish, uh, that describes everything from the furthest reaches of the observable universe all the way down to the uh, microscopic uh, layers um, and the makeup of cells, uh, the makeup of organisms, the structure of DNA, uh, the, function, the structure and functioning of the brain. Uh, this is all beautifully uh, articulated in, these, in, this, in this framework that we can call Western physical science. Uh, and again, we, we call this Western physical science, but everybody does it. Uh, and it has led to all of the wonderful things that we like to play with, like computers like this and mobile phones. If you have a mobile phone, you are a beneficiary of, of uh, this way of looking at the, at the universe. So it really works. Uh, and the... Um, and just to introduce a few more terms, I don't want to get too caught up in this, but uh, uh, beautifully translated by Karma here, uh, these ideas of uh, uh, physicalism or physical materialism uh, is another way, it's, it's a word that can be used to describe the framework. I keep using this term framework. Science, I said, is just looking for knowledge, gathering data, uh, doing experiments. However, we interpret all of that right now in a particular framework which can be called physicalism or physical materialism. It's that everything is made of matter, basically, uh, or more technically stated, that everything is describable in terms of mathematical quantities attached to coordinates in space-time. Uh, as a technical definition. So masses, energies, field strengths, locations, space-time coordinates, and so forth. Uh, that's the way everything is described, including what's going on in the brain. I mean, we don't usually talk about it in exactly that language, but if you really trace it, uh, you could. And that has given rise to a kind of a, a hierarchy or connection between different fields of science, uh, with physics often considered the most fundamental, describing things at the very microscopic uh, levels of interaction. Uh, and then atoms uh, are described by chemistry, and the behavior of atoms can be described by physics, but when you get larger number of atoms coming together to form molecules, then a new kind of area of scientific description emerges that we call chemistry. Uh, and then if some of these atoms come together, molecules come together into particular stable configurations uh, and form uh, uh, entities that can uh, uh, maintain their stability over time by consuming energy uh, and replicate themselves, we call that life. Um, and that's studied by biology. And if we look at a particular piece of biology, which is uh, related to how the body and brain are working to uh, produce behavior and analyze sensory information, we call that area uh, neuroscience. What's missing from this uh, is mentality or mental experience or mind or consciousness or uh, 
uh, whatever we wish to call it, uh, that experiential piece. Now, another thing that I don't want to spend a lot of time on right now and is an important subject that uh, it would be nice to put together a nice coherent piece on sometime uh, would be the different ways to that those words are used because uh, in in Western science uh, there's really very limited um, uh, history of being interested in describing uh, mind consciousness mental experience and so forth that's been in fact it's been almost explicitly excluded beginning with Descartes and Newton uh, and continuing to the end of the 20th century uh, the focus was always on the external world and what could be described by mathematical uh, relations uh, so uh, so in Western scientific language Western scientific language or is impoverished uh, in the way that those terms are used compared to say uh, Buddhist philosophy which has a much more uh, elaborated and nuanced appreciation of, of those terms. Uh, so I'll use them kind of loosely and hopefully you'll forgive me for that right now and we can come back and repair those things later. Uh, so there's, there's no place in this particular hierarchy for mind as it's conceived right now uh, which leads to what has been called in Western science the mind-body problem. That is, okay, we've got this mind thing, this mental experience thing, this consciousness thing, whatever we call it. How is it related to processes that we can measure uh, by our technologies and scientific analysis that are happening in our brain and our body? And uh, I'm not being exclusive to the brain here. We know the brain is very important for the mind because if you produce damage to the brain, you get really powerful and specific damage to mental function. Uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the body that's also related to our mental experience. So how are they connected is the question. And if you ask this question to, a, uh, to most neuroscientists, if, if they're, uh, uh, they'll probably give an answer something like this, as the solution, and most philosophers too, uh, that we must have to somehow identify these subjective internal mental processes with their objective describable, physically describable neural correlates. By neural correlate, I mean what can we measure that's happening in the brain when this mental experience is also happening. If we're feeling happy, uh, what kind of brain activity is related to that and body activity. If we're feeling sad, what kind of brain activity or body activity is related to that. And then many folks, even though they don't know how at this point, uh, will simply somehow identify that uh, with, the, with the mental experience. And nobody knows, I say simply and obviously, but it's completely mysterious how this happens uh, and nobody can answer that they simply believe that because this perspective this framework of uh, scientific uh, explanation has been so successful for so many centuries now that it will have to eventually be successful for this too we just need to study the brain more build better fMRI machines, do more experiments with more different kinds of people, and it eventually will emerge uh, somehow from, from body and brain physiology uh, how these things are connected. And, and maybe that will happen. Uh, that, that is certainly one possibility, even though nobody kn exactly knows how. Now, a hundred years ago or so, one of the great pioneers in uh, American uh, experimental psychology was this fellow, William James, and he was very interested in the study of the mind uh, and how the mind is connected uh, to the body and the brain. And he actually proposed uh, back more than a hundred years ago that one way for the science of mind to move forward would be to develop a uh, rigorously empirical uh, introspective uh, way of making observations and doing experiments. Somewhat like the contemplative traditions have a long history of doing, 
uh, but James seemed to not have a lot of knowledge about, uh, about those traditions at that point. He tried to get things like this going in American experimental psychology, uh, and it went absolutely nowhere. Uh, in fact, it got uh, kind of completely uh, 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 bulldozed by uh, the person, the, the movement that uh, uh, Bruce Grayson mentioned this morning of behaviorism, where uh, rather than study the mind on its own terms of subjective internal experience, just study the brain and the body. We're better at doing that. But James also said something else, which was very, very uh, profound. Uh, in a piece that he wrote in, back in 1895, he also pointed out that all of these ways of observing uh, matter uh, are based on the physical science of the time, and that the assumptions of those natural sciences uh, are provisional and revisable. And he said this in 1895, uh, and it was remarkable because uh, many physicists in 1895 thought that physics was a closed book and that everything interesting had been discovered um, and it would just be a matter of measuring things with more precision. Uh, that would be the future of physics. Uh, and they were, no group of people were ever more wrong than the folks who said that because uh, just a few years later, beginning in 1900 with Max Planck and then following up with Einstein in 1905, uh, the seeds of what was to become the quantum theory, they didn't have the quantum theory, they had just had the, the notion of quanta of energy, um, but it led uh, to an enormous revolution in physics, a true revolution. By revolution, I mean before and after these events, uh, people viewed the world in very different ways. And when it came to viewing the world of physics, it was very different before and after uh, the quantum theory, which was developed in the 1920s, uh, beginning with these guys, Heisenberg, uh, Schrodinger, and Bohr. Um, and, and what the quantum theory does is uh, it, it, it rose out of a necessity of describing experimentally experimental facts that were gathered in the study of atoms that were completely inexplicable in terms of the physics that had been developed by, by Newton, Maxwell, Einstein up to the 20th century and so forth. Um, and uh, it is, as uh, Paul just mentioned, uh, it is really you know, very much illustrated in this double slit experiment, which I won't dwell on, uh, but just to point out, I mean, this actually does show pictures of single photons of light hitting a photographic film, uh, and you so you can pick out, you know, the dots one at a time, and, and it shows as over time they build up illustrating an, illus uh, uh, an interference pattern, which demonstrates that these single particles of light have somehow gone through both slits and interfered with themselves. Now, I'm not going to dwell on that except to say that this was the first hint that the way, uh, the kind, the way in which questions are asked in, in fundamental physics uh, is now appreciated to have an impact on defining the result of the experiment but it goes beyond that. It, what the more recent uh, experiments have demonstrated is that there's a way in which the very essence of physical reality is not definable until the question is asked, which is a very profound statement. Now, I don't really, I don't even have a deep enough understanding of that, and I've been like struggling with this for years now. Uh, so if you don't fully understand what I say when I say that, don't worry about it. Just, but believe me, when, when the, the bottom line with quantum mechanics is that there's a, there's a, a very, very strong suggestion that there's something about uh, the interaction with uh, the what we call the external physical world that is very much intertwined in some way with our own mentality, our own decisions, our own consciousness, our own perception, something like that. And nobody has a clear answer to this. You know, many very brilliant physicists have thought, beginning with the founders, uh, uh, thought about this and, and continuing 
to this day with, uh, with many very prominent physicists thinking about this. And everyone agrees that this is a problem and no one has uh, a good answer to it. But so the seeds are there of some very interesting stuff connecting uh, mind uh, and brain in some way. So uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier, I think, yeah, you, I think you, Bruce, you mentioned how uh, this was appreciated by, by uh, people like Bohr, Heisenberg, and Schrodinger, and they, they, immediate, they also appreciated that they weren't psychologists, they weren't biologists, they weren't neuroscientists, they didn't really know how to deal with consciousness, so they didn't really go there. They simply said, there's weird stuff happening here, uh, uh, and the equations still work and they allow us to make predictions and you know maybe someday somebody will do something with this and uh, maybe this is the day uh, so in summary uh, there are a number of of pieces of data and things around that support uh, some kind of expanded framework of of, um, of explanatory framework needed uh, to describe these things that relate to uh, our minds or our, exp or our consciousness. You know, one is the simple inability uh, so far to really get some kind of experiential or conscious awareness out of brain physiology, out of the movement of atoms and molecules and so forth inside our brain. Uh, very powerful data uh, that was described by Bruce Grayson this morning from uh, near-death experiences and reincarnation uh, studies. And of course, you have many more examples of, of reincarnation stories uh, that, are not, uh, that are not explained by simply saying that whatever consciousness is, is a product of our brain and body working in some way. I mean, certainly our bodies and brains are very much a piece of the picture. Uh, while we're alive, uh, and uh, somehow there is more going on. It may not be that there's a simple way that's graspable by us yet uh, or ever uh, to explain reincarnation, uh, but there may be you know, very interesting and weird things going on in the movement of uh, you know, kind of characteristics of our consciousness across lifetimes in some way. There are also things that we haven't talked much about, but for which there's an enormous amount of scientific evidence, uh, data collected over more than 100 years of careful experimentation, demonstrating things like telepathic communication between people, uh, uh, precognition, that is having uh, some sense of things that are going to happen that haven't happened yet. Uh, and again, these are very common in say the Buddhist tradition where people have precognitive dreams that will uh, indicate that something is going to happen to uh, look out for. Uh, in, uh, in the traditions of, of India, the ancient traditions of India, inc uh, uh, including Buddhism, you know, people talk about cities uh, or other special powers uh, that can come uh, from long periods of, of practice. Uh, which would include things like precognitive and telepathic abilities. So there is a lot of data, but none of it, you know, it is taken seriously by uh, Western science because there's no way it can be explained uh, in the framework that we have right now. And so, just in conclusion, I'll, I'll also say uh, that if you if you talk to the people who are really working at the frontiers of uh, of, of, uh, of physics right now. Uh, folks that are involved in particle physics, this large hadron collider in Switzerland, France border that where they're banging particles together at very high energy and trying to create new things. Uh, you know, some of them are very confident that any day now they'll discover the Higgs boson and that'll be the final proof that the standard model, which is a nice package of uh, way of describing elementary particles that uh, has been developed over the last 30 years. Um, will be complete in some way. Uh, and others will say, you know, I mean, I have a standing bet with some of my physics colleagues. Uh, they won't find the Higgs boson in, 
in the next three years in the Large Hadron Collider. You know, it's just, uh, and that might be the most interesting thing. If they don't find it, uh, that means that uh, there's something really kind of missing in the way that we're uh, conceptualizing microscopic matter. So there's very interesting stuff that uh, at the frontiers of physics way down there uh, that may not be easily explicable. And if we go the other direction, you know, there have been several allusions already to uh, dark matter and dark energy, which composes something like 95% of what we believe the energetic content of the universe is. Uh, and it could be that uh, there, will need, there will be some completely new way of looking at the large scale structure of the universe uh, that will come about uh, before we understand these things. And so uh, again, I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, a couple of weeks, well, the day before I left for India, he's involved in an experiment to detect dark matter in some mine deep in South Dakota. And uh, he said, you know, I don't think we're going to find anything. I think the, what will really contribute is that we will very carefully demonstrate to the limits of experimental precision that we can't detect it. Uh, and that means that there's something really missing in the way that we're going to need to kind of look at the, at the structure of the universe, which is very exciting. You know, I, I actually believe that we are poised uh, to, uh, for a revolution. Uh, in the mind sciences, you know, the, the science of mind in Western science has not had any revolutions like biology did with Darwin or physics did with quantum mechanics and relativity and Copernicus and Newton. Uh, and mind science is really poised. Uh, and wouldn't it be interesting if whatever the revolution is in mind science somehow also embraced uh, Con things in cosmology, and there was greater insight there. I mean, that's a, that's a long shot. It's a wild one, but, uh, you know, wilder things could happen. Uh, and so that's really what makes this dialogue super interesting, because uh, the, the revolution is poised to happen, perhaps, uh, and uh, part of that would be a more uh, uh, deeply uh, uh, analytic uh, examination of the mind, which many of you are expert at, uh, and also the capacity to really think out of the box, uh, to think in new ways about how to uh, uh, explain phenomena uh, that may not be explicable easily from either of our perspectives, that may need some you know, new synthesis, some completely new way of looking at things. And wouldn't it be cool if it happened while we were around in this lifetime to uh, see what it is? So thank you for your attention and uh, to be continued. Okay, thanks very much, David. And five minutes, say, before the break, but if uh, guests want to have a few questions. Joe <laughs> Naranzu Nambigi, Shizula Tawaina, Deli Dode, Karsumers and Nambigi and Zu and Zuden Chuji Domiganala, and a Shinuji de Mene Yacha, Nuji Sinji Yene Matros, Tuzinigi, Dunsi de Nila Town de Sambala, and a Shinuji de Toma Town de Sambala, Lungi, Lung Chamo, Nangatumbigi, Lonely Lung Chamojina, Zumigi, Meda and Chelazo, and a Sat Tuzinet Rode, Namjigi Shidore. Taranajigi, Dunsi Shima de la Tawaina, uh Tadigin, Zamalin Dito, Yodiju, Sudin, and Jig, Zinjigi, Tomade, 
ani ji zambile rang ti ni chuan ji riwa ani zaka jimal ti ni chuan ji ris ni an tro thunu ji shuai tu jena um uh, my question is that um it's related with uh biology and so this is for david and in biology when, when we talk about the evolution of uh, living beings um we talk about the life begins in ocean from a single cell organism to a multicellular organisms and then to primates and uh, finally human beings <coughs> from in buddhist traditions uh however have a different uh, a completely opposite kind of view it when um we started in buddhist uh tradition it says that when the a uh, universe when the life uh, life started uh it has got the more power uh mentally and physically and then it gradually reduces with time and when we talk about the uh world that we live in physical world that we live in it talk about uh the the generation of wind element first and then the coming into being of earth element and then the fire and gradually there is also a process of how uh, this physical world is coming to being and um, so my question really is that uh, when we talk about the life on this earth uh, and the uh, the physical substance or in the unis physical substance that is embodied in our body or embodied in uh, living uh, beings uh, can we say that it is come from a different uh, planet or the extra uh, terrestrial area or mm, is it so if is it just come from the earth itself are they talking about the origin of that first cell how that first uh, cell on this planet came into being Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question, um, and uh, the excellence of that question really is highlighted by uh, the answer is not known in Western science. Many brilliant scientists have worked on that and are continuing to work on it, the origin of life, um, and we do not have a story uh, to explain that other than the conventional one is that, well, with lots of time and lots of banging around, something will happen. It's one of the reasons the astrobiological research is so interesting because if you try to look for life in other places and it looks the same or it looks different that really has value in addressing this question some uh scientists some of prominence you know including people like Francis Crick who first uh, was discovered the structure of DNA co-discoverer of the structure of DNA have suggested that life on earth actually did come from other places in the universe and maybe landed as some kind of spore or something billions of years ago and then evolved here so it's a it's a wonderful question for which we don't know the answer and you might have you know more to say given that you know yeah i'll make a few comments um so that the idea of life that travels between worlds is called panspermia um and uh it's a 150 year old idea in science uh and so astrophysicists planetary scientists have you know investigated it taken it seriously and the answer at the moment seems to be that transport of potentially living organisms inside rocks uh is quite possible within the solar system um and in fact the conveyor belt the sort of inefficient transport system in the solar system works quite well uh from mars to the earth because Mars has weaker gravity, less atmosphere, Earth is closer to the sun, less efficiently going the other way. And since provocatively since we know that Mars was almost certainly habitable 3 or 4 million, billion years ago, it is distinctly possible, quite possible, very hard to prove that life on Earth came from Mars. Um so there's possibilities of moving life within a solar system. The question of can life travel between stars has also been investigated a lot in the last decade and it turns out to travel on a rock there are two issues there's one can the rock be ejected from the system and second 
does the rock take so long to travel that a microbe could survive? The answer to the second question is that microbes have been resuscitated after being dormant for 15 million years, and that's about the time it would take to travel between near star systems. So in principle, a dormant microbe could survive the journey. But the probability of a, a rock being ejected from a planet and landing on a moon or a planet of another star system turns out to be infinitesimally small. So astronomical calculations suggest that life transport between star systems is very, very unlikely. And of course, if life originated elsewhere, you've essentially just shoved the problem you know, somewhere else. You haven't explained the origin, you've just put it off into another place. You still have a problem, you still have a thing to explain. Um, so that's what the astronomers have figured out.